Welcome to the Orchestrate All the Things podcast. I'm George Amadiotis and we'll be connecting the dots together. After data privacy and GDPR, the EU wants to leave its mark on AI by regulating it with the EU AI Act. Here's what it is, what it means for the world at large, when it's expected to take effect, and what experts from the Mozilla Foundation have to recommend to improve it. I hope you will enjoy the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Well, hi, George. Thanks for having us uh, in this interview. I'm Mark Sermon. I'm the executive director of Mozilla Foundation, and I'm uh, here in Toronto. And uh, I run our overall sort of philanthropy and advocacy work and are kind of trying to push the field of thinking about how to make a, a healthier internet. And a key theme for us in the last few years has been trustworthy AI. Um, because data and machine learning and you know what we call today AI are just really such central technical and social and business uh, fabric to what the internet is and how the internet inter intersects with society and all of our lives. Uh, so you know we really think that um, that that's a kind of key topic to to sort through is what's the shape of uh, how AI works. Um, just like we asked the question of the what's the shape of how the web works 20 years ago uh, as we were starting to think about Firefox. Um, so my role is really to kind of get gather resources and build momentum around that set of questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, and yeah, also thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Maximilian Gantz, uh, or Max. I'm a, a senior policy researcher at Mozilla. Uh, I mostly work on issues related to AI and data. Um, and that includes this uh, sort of first wave of AI focused uh, legislation that we're currently seeing, um, including the AI Act in the EU, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, well, that's a good segue to move on to what is, I guess, the main part of the conversation. So uh, the EU AI Act and uh, Mozilla's uh, reaction and feedback to, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, regulation. So uh, first, let me uh, try and set the stage in a way by saying that, uh, well, it's obvious how this, uh, uh, this act is relevant for people who live in the EU. It may be less obvious uh, for non-EU residents, but uh, the way I see it, and I think the way that you frame it as well, is that it can function in a way uh, similar to the way GDPR functions. So, uh, setting uh, setting an example, and also uh, in terms of enforceability, let's say, making companies uh, who want to be active in the EU market, uh, well, comply with this uh, sort of regulation. So, in that sense, it's relevant uh, not just for the EU, but for the world at large. And so I think uh, it would make sense to uh, just briefly touch upon the, the life cycle of uh, this uh, EU AI Act and where we are at the moment at this uh, life cycle. So as far as I know, it was uh, made public uh, about a year ago, so in 2021. And there was a call for, uh, for feedback uh, from the uh, EU committee. And I think this is when uh, you first engage with that. Uh, but I think you probably know this better than, than I do. So you can uh, share with, uh, with me and the audience as well. What, what I might do is I, I might share a little bit of the prehistory of the mm -hmm. EI Act and how Mozilla started to think about it. And then Max, you can talk about where things are at now and, and how we've been thinking about it or where it's been in the past year. So that, you know, the, the prehistory really is we've been thinking about for three or four years, the question of like, how is AI shaping the future of the internet and, and how it connects to social and political questions, economic questions. And so when the EU formed the, the high level expert group on AI, which preceded uh, that, that act, and started talking about trustworthy AI, we paid attention because we've seen that the GPR has had a ripple effect uh, in putting questions around data and, and people's rights and relationship to data on the global agenda. And we thought the EU may again be able to have that kind of impact uh, if it moved to actual regulation on, on AI. And so we've really built up our focus on trustworthy AI shaping where industry goes with, with a set of values around responsible AI from around the same time as, as the EU even started talking about it at the high level expert group level. 
Thank you. Yeah, and Max, if you want to kind of pick it up, how it moved from that into the act. Yeah, um, of course. Um, so, so basically, the first draft there, there is a process beforehand, but the first draft of what this law could look like, uh, we got uh, in April last year, and since then, uh, everyone involved in this entire process has been sort of preparing to engage. Uh, so the European Parliament had to decide which committee and which people in those committees would work on it. Uh, civil society organizations sort of had their read of the text and developed their position. And the point we're at right now is basically where the exciting bit starts uh, in a way because the European Parliament is developing its position. Um, and once the European Parliament has sort of consolidated what they understand with the, under the term trustworthy AI um, and proposed their ideas on how to change the initial draft. Um, member states are doing the same thing. Um, and then we'll sort of have this final round of negotiations between the parliament, the commission, member states, and that's when this will be passed into law. Um, but the EU policymaking process is a bit of a, a long and winding road. Um, so we actually don't have a very robust idea of when that might be. Um, there are some people saying they want to get this through by the end of the year. Uh, I don't think that's very realistic. Um, but I, I think we're looking at a, roughly a year maybe until there is some agreement on what this should look like in the end. And of course, then there's, there's a, a transitional period between this being passed into law and this actually taking effect, um, like with the GDPR, for example, as well, which took uh, I think two years between being passed uh, and taking effect to implement. Um, so we we have a long way to go uh, before this is in its final form. Yeah, yeah, and well, in in some ways that may be a good thing because it means that uh, there is more uh, more time for uh, uh, for organizations such as uh, Mozilla, for example, and for the public at large to uh, to be uh, informed and eventually even also to to be engaged uh, with uh, with it as well. And this is what you've started doing uh, uh, also. Um, if I were to summarize um, the uh, the core, let's say, of the approach uh, this uh, this act is taking, I would I think. It, it comes down to what's called the so-called risk-based approach. So there is a sort of classification for uh, for uh, AI products, let's say, uh, in terms of the risk. Uh, it, they range from unacceptable to, to which basically means that uh, products uh, that are classified in this category will not be deployed in any shape or form, with a couple of exceptions maybe uh, in the EU. Then there's high risk uh, and the, the, the products for which uh, people have to uh, disclose certain transparency uh, obligations and then minimal or no risk for which there's no uh, uh, no requirements uh, whatsoever. Uh, in a way, this reminds me of the uh, of the system that uh, is uh, effective in the EU for uh, characterizing uh, devices in terms of their energy requirements. Again, you have a scale, and um, to the non-expert, um, you could say that it helps uh, get uh, get a feeling of uh, where its product uh, fits in this uh, in this scale. Uh, would you say this is an an apt analogy, and do you think this approach makes sense for uh, for non-experts? Let Max take this one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a good question. And the, the analogizing part is always uh, an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, I, I think what's, what's really important here is that, um, I mean, the risk-based approach is really trying to minimize the, the impact of the regulation and all the obligations that come with it um, on those people or organizations that develop and deploy AI systems that are of little to no concern, right? Um, so they really want to focus most or all of their attention on the bits where it gets tricky and where risk is introduced to people's safety, um, to people's rights, to people's privacy, um, and so on. Um, and I think that that's also the part that we want to focus on. Um, because in the end, like regulation isn't an end, an end in and of itself. Um, so what, what we want to accomplish with our uh, recommendations and our advocacy work around this um, is that the parts in the regulation that focus on how to mitigate or prevent risks from materializing, um, that this is strengthened. 
in the regulation than the final act. Um, and I, th I think there's, like, there's a lot of analogies to be drawn to other sort of risk-based approaches that we see in, in European law and in regulation elsewhere. Um, but in the end, it's also important to like look at the risks that risks that are very specific to to the specific case, um, which is basically answering the question: How can we make sure that AI is a trustworthy, um, but b also like developed and deployed with the care and like the due diligence um, that needs to go into this process um, to make sure that no one is harmed uh, and that uh, like at the bottom line, um, this is a net benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, coming back to the uh, to the uh, life cycle of uh, this act, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, right now we're at the stage where, well, the initial draft was published, then uh, member of the uh, members of the committee that uh, were assigned to, uh, to uh, look into that uh, gave their feedback, and this is also the stage that external actors uh, Mozilla included also give uh, their feedback. So I saw that uh, there was a blog post that you published uh, recently that included um, the, the core of your recommendations for improving uh, the AI, AI Act, and that was focused around uh, three points, uh, ensuring accountability, creating systemic transparency, and giving individuals and communities a stronger voice. Would you like to uh, quickly summarize uh, those points? Maybe Max, you can summarize the points, and then I might put a, a answer a little bit about um, how we how we think about taking those forward and influencing the legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, you, you rightly correctly gave us like the the headlines of our recommendations, um, and by by accountability, what we really mean that it's important to figure out who should be responsible for what along the AI supply chain, right? Um, because risks should be addressed where they come up. Um, so whether that's in like the technical design stage or in the deployment stage. Um, so it's, it's really important to make sure that the organizations or the people who are involved at each stage in the process have to sort of perform the due diligence that actually fits those steps. Um, the second part, systemic transparency, um, I think is really important. Um, A, uh, because I think user-facing transparency is important too, but that doesn't really cut it, right? Um, it's, it's nice if a user or an end user knows when they're interacting with an AI system. Um, but what we also need at a higher level is for journalists and researchers um, and also regulators to be able to scrutinize the AI systems that are like on the market that are put to use and how these are affecting people and communities on the ground. Um, so we have to make sure that the AI Act in its final form comprises like mechanisms enabling this type of scrutiny. Uh, and the AI Act, one thing it proposes is a public database where people or organizations would have to register high-risk AI systems. Um, and I, I think that's really great. That can be a really important mechanism. Um, but what it sort of excludes right now is those deploying AI. So those who would have to register the systems would be the developers. Um, but like I said, risk also really depends on the exact context in which it is deployed, um, on the intended purpose, um, sort of like the organizational environment. So it's also really important that deployers um, those putting AI systems to use sort of have to disclose some information as to how they use these systems. Um, and the third point, um, which is about empowering individuals and communities, um, is about that one thing that's pretty much missing from the original draft um, are the people who are affected by high-risk AI systems and who would end up having to deal with the consequences when something goes wrong. Um, so what we're asking for is that the AI Act um, ultimately includes a sort of bottom-up oversight mechanism uh, and equips people with um, a mechanism allowing them to contest decisions or to, to seek redress uh, or complain to authorities. Um, to give you the, the rough summary of our three main recommendations, but I'll uh, pass it over to, to Mark to, to fill in the gaps I left. 
Pretty no, funky. no gaps. The, but the thing I would say, um, the thing I would say is if you think about these broad recommendations, accountability, transparency, making sure that there's a, a, a kind of public and community voice, um, the regulation, as in any case with, with regulation of a complex ecosystem, like we're talking about with the internet and with AI, can only really provide the, the guardrails and the, and the kind of framework for action. And it's really important that at this stage, different parties who are actually gonna to have to live in this framework, get a chance to weigh it into, what does it look like practically to design accountability? What does it look like practically to develop accountability and, and citizen uh, feedback? And so we really see our role in a pr process like this and helping to drive some of that conversation. We're really connected to a part of the public, including the European public that really cares about these issues. How do we actually get them involved in, in shaping this uh, and having a voice going forward? We're also very involved in the tech industry. What are the technical norms in terms of building accountability into systems and understanding how developers support deployer, deployers to be more trustworthy or you know how deployers actually educate themselves uh, to be more trustworthy and also to build transparency into systems. So, you know, this is not purely a matter of like influencing what's in the legislation. That's certainly a part of the focus of the recommendations, but it's also this is the time in the life cycle of, of an act like this to be working with all the players to figure out practically uh, how is this actually going to play out in real time. And I don't I don't think that that really was done enough with the GDPR, and that's why our stance really is as much as a facilitator and a convener um, around topics like in the recommendations uh, as pushing for particular language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, first, as a kind of uh, overall comment, let's say your um, your recommendations seem to be like they're in the right direction. They, they make sense, and I think they really add to uh, what was already there. Uh, and actually, the question that I had lined up for you was uh, precisely around what you just touched upon. So uh, first, what's the process from, from this point on? And well, uh, is there some sort of institutional, let's say, uh, process through which feedback such as yours is taken into account? And is there, I don't know, some, some kind of guarantee, let's say that, well, Yes, this sounds like a good idea. Therefore, it will be incorporated in the final uh, in the final text. And uh, the second part, which is per perhaps even more uh, uh, more uh, vague, is how does I don't know the the average individual uh, get involved in this uh, in this thing? Can they, for example, get behind uh, your recommendations, or is there any other way through which they can submit their own ideas or evaluate existing ideas? Um, well, it's, Max and I may have different angles on this, so I'll, I'll, maybe we'll both take the question. Um, I would say I mean, the, the way to get involved or, or the step we're at is, is really the normal democratic process. I and mean, you have people inside of, uh, you know, elected, you have elected officials looking at these questions. You also have people inside the public service and the, uh, the EU asking these questions, and then you have industry and the public having a debate about these questions. And I, I don't think there's a particular mechanism. Certainly people like us are going to weigh in with specific recommendations. Uh, and by weighing in with us, you kind of help amplify those. But I, I just do think that the open democratic conversation, being in public, allying yourself and connecting to people whose uh, you know ideas you agree with, wrestling with and surfacing the hard topics in public, uh, you know, th that's all, that's what's going to make a difference. And, and that's certainly where we're focused. Max, I don't know if you want to say anything more specific or technical about the process. Um, I'm, I mean, I, th I think what you said is is right. Um, at, at this point, what it's really about is about like swaying public opinion and swaying the opinion of people who are uh, in the position to make decisions and to engage, which means parliamentarians, member state officials, um, officials within the European Commission. Um, so, like like Mark said, it's it's about leading a, a broader debate um, with everyone involved and making sure you have the right arguments uh, to convince people. Um, and then, at, I mean, at a more grassroots level, what an individual person can do it's it's the 
the same as always, I would say. I mean, if, if you're in the EU, you can, you can write uh, your local MEP. Um, you can be uh, active on uh, social media and try to amplify uh, voices you agree with, uh, putting forward good ideas. Um, you can sign petitions. Um, there's, there's all sorts of ways um, of being a vocal, uh, engaged citizen, I guess. Um, and that's, that's no different here. Okay, okay, I see. All right, so then let's come full circle in a way to, uh, to where we started the conversation. So the background uh, of your uh, involvement. Um, I found out, I admit I didn't know previously uh, to, uh, to this opportunity, that there seems to be a framework of sorts that you have developed in order uh, to guide your, um, your approach to, to AI. And this is also this also seems to be uh, guiding your uh, specific uh, engagement uh, with this uh, AI uh, act. So, um, would you like to explain a little bit the process through which you arrived at this framework? And well, um, how do you see uh, this particular uh, recommendation that uh, you're you're uh, putting forward uh, in the in the context of your overall approach? We've been thinking about this topic of trustworthy AI for a number of years now. And really, in many ways, on, on almost a parallel schedule to the EU, where they had the high level expert group and considered the topics and listened to people and then came with the act. Uh, you know, we, we went and looked at what are the questions that are defining the health of, of the internet and where the internet is going three or four years back. And the question of trustworthy AI came up as a, as a really top uh, focus. And it's why we put our, our energy behind that. And we have, worked with and built a community around the world uh, of um, of people who care about how impact of people who care about how AI impacts society uh, and in that talk focused on sorry I lost my train of thought because I'm, I'm a little bit worried about time I'll just say that no worries um, so we've worked with people around the world to to kind of map out a theory of how can we take AI make it more trustworthy and really focused on two broad topics with then four, uh, four places where we think we can push. Then the two broad topics are both making sure that you design AI systems and AI driven business models with human agency in mind, people can make choices. And that's not always the case. You think about um, you know, content recommendation engines from YouTube or Facebook, it's actually not about us making choices, it's about choices being made for us. And so I think one of the things is how do we include human agency in the design of, of AI systems? And then the second point is, how do you focus on accountability? If there are harms that come from AI, as is really the focus of the, the act, how do you make sure really there are consequences, which of course is gonna drive different norms and different behavior in the design of systems if people think oh uh you know what i'm designing is gonna uh have an impact on whether a person gets a job or not unfairly uh, or has an impact on on democracy and you know whether the information ecosystem that we're in is fair and 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 truthful so these questions of agency and accountability are really our you know our focus and we think that the act is a really good backdrop one that can have global ripple effects to push things in the right direction on these topics. And in that, you know, there, there's four things we think can, can make a difference. One, pushing the norms in industry. Who are the people who build things? How are they built? And then pushing what gets built. You know, do we actually have technology that keeps people in mind and that has accountability and transparency designed in? Third, you know, do people start to demand more accountable, uh, AI systems or just more accountable tech products, in, which all today include AI. And then the last point, which is the supporting one, but, you know, in our view is not the core one, it is what regulations and what uh, legal environment support trust for the AI. But really, we see that as something that is enabling about the other things without people building different uh, technology in a different way and people wanting to use that technology, the law, you know, just is, is a piece of paper. It is a piece of paper, uh, you know, people might argue, but one that uh, can help drive things forward. And again, pointing to the, uh, to the previous example of uh, GDPR, it, it did push things forward, not just in terms of, well, 
uh, buzz and um, hype, but also in, in real terms. So the appointment or creation of new jobs, for example, new new roles, and also uh, pushing the, um, the source of creation, uh, uh, the source of development uh, creation forward process in terms of, of having to comply with uh, certain requirements and even creating uh, altogether new classes of software products. So you could argue that you can expect similar things to happen with this type of regulation as well. I think that that's the hope. And uh, at the same time with GDPR, sometimes you've gotten really interesting new companies and new software products that keep privacy in mind. I mean, I, I could list a number of them. And sometimes you've just gotten annoying pop up reminders about, you know, yeah. your data being collected and, and cookies. And so making sure that a law like this drives real change and real value for people uh, is a tricky matter. And, and it's why right now the focus should be on what are the practical things that the industry and developers and deployers can do to make AI more trustworthy and make sure that the, the regulations actually reflect and incentivize um, that kind of action and, and not just kind of sit up in the clouds. Yeah, well, like you said, it's uh, it's a long and winding process, and I think in many ways this uh, specific uh, AI act is um, is is a trailblazer uh, worldwide, and even even still, even even in, in that uh, scenario, well, we still have a few years ahead of us to uh, to be able to see it uh, in full effect. So, yeah, there's there's still a long way to to go, but. Uh, Hopefully, um, that that should set uh, a good example. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. And we're certainly there to, you know, to be a partner and a, a support for that um, happening. Great. Uh, yeah. So thanks. I think we did more or less uh, manage to uh, to keep it short. Uh, so I'm, I'm I think I'm good. Uh, unless there's any other uh, closing thoughts that you'd like to share, oh, feel free. No, nope, that's great, George. I uh, really yeah. appreciate you inviting us. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook.